Hey team, welcome to the last unit for Bio 111. This unit covers evolution and population genetics. So uh, we'll get started uh, with this PowerPoint and the PowerPoint is in the last module of your Moodle shell. And we'll just, uh, I'm just going to do it as an actual PowerPoint. It won't really, yours is in there as PDF file. So you'll be able to open it. Okay. So evolution, just the word, it can be potentially um, controversial, right? Uh, what does evolution mean? If you look at it in its bare bones form, uh, you could define it as the idea that a species changes over time due to random mutation and selective pressures from the environment. Now, let's just stop for just a second and think about this. We know that random mutations occur in organisms. Uh, in some cases, we know why there could be a trigger, for example, radiation. In other cases, we don't know why mutations just spontaneously occur as the DNA is being replicated. Okay. And depending upon the mutation, the particular environment may select for or against that mutation, or that mutation could also be neutral. In other words, the environment doesn't select for or against it. So this is the basis of evolution, the idea that mutations occur in a population. And based upon whether that mutation is beneficial or not, in a given environment, and that's important to realize because the environment can change as well. And so a mutation which at one point was beneficial, we'll see might not be beneficial forever because the environment could change. Or uh, a, a, a mutation that was a non-beneficial mutation could become beneficial if the environment changes. So I hope that um, that makes a little bit of sense to you. So my colleagues get a little annoyed with me for this next slide uh, because this is a biology class. You know, we're supposed to be focusing on biology, but there's also the creation theory. And I understand that, you know, this is religious dogma, not biology. But I think it's interesting and really quite fascinating, honestly, to kind of just have this one slide where we can compare and contrast uh, the two ideas. Uh, evolution is still considered a theory. There are scientists that want to make it a law because they say it always happens. Uh, the idea of creation is based upon um, based upon faith, right? And so uh, faith-based things we don't consider science, just to be clear. So what is, is fascinating, though, is just to compare these. So Evolution says life can be explained by a combination of random mutation and natural selection, the environment, nature, selecting for a given mutation or against it. Uh, creationism says, you know, there are lots of different kinds of creationism. If you're interested in learning more, take a world religions class, but there are some common threads. Uh, and so if we just look at the, the Christianity version of creation, it says that an all-knowing, omnipotent being created life in its current form. That's what you know, that's what creationism says in Christian faith. Uh, another place where it's very interesting is the age of the earth. The evolutionists tell us, based upon science, that the earth is exceedingly old, more than six billion years old. Uh, creationist theory, uh, Christianity literally interpreted, says that the earth is relatively young and can be measured in thousands of years. Uh, evolution, is there, is it testable? It is testable, and we're going to talk about uh, some cases of modern day evolution where we're actually able to see evolution in progress actually happening in real time. So it is measurable and testable. Is creationism testable? It is not. It is based upon faith, uh, and it's not really, faith is not something you can scientifically test. Okay, that's what we mean by testable. Scientific evidence for evolution includes many things, most notably the fossil record, comparative embryology, DNA, um, 
comparative anatomy, and we're going to go through these different uh, different things. Scientific evidence for creation, scientific evidence there is not. Okay, so that just gives you a quick rundown um, of the of the two ideas. <clears throat> now, there's this other thing. It's called intelligent design, <laughs> and I'm fascinated by intelligent design. My sense is that you know, and, and many scientists are, again get very annoyed by it because it's their take is that it, this is an attempt for the creationists to get uh, creationism in the science class. And so what intelligent design says, something's going on. We don't know what, but there's something out there that's, you know, going on, uh, which to me is annoying. It's like, if you're a creationist, I'm fine with that. At least you take a stand and you say what you believe in. This is not really taking a stand. It's just saying there's something going on. We don't know what. The, the name intelligent design comes from some of the arguments that, that have been made that say, you know, um, there has to be, the, the, if you look at the human body, for example, the, the eye, it's so complex. There's no way that you could explain the human eye by random mutation. So there has to be some intelligent being that designed it. That's the that's where the intelligent design part comes from. And what I would say is, well, okay, for every example of intelligent design that you give me, I can give you an example of unintelligent design. <laughs> for example, yes, the human eye is magnificent, but what about the human heart, right? If you look at the human heart, You'll notice if you study the anatomy that the blood vessels that actually feed the heart are very small. Uh, the the um, cardiac artery, for example. And so what happens over time is this very small diameter blood vessel, it gets clogged. And when it gets clogged, people have a heart attack and they die, okay? Or they have a myocardial infarction as it's called and they may or may not die. but you know, that is unintelligent design. Why not make that vessel two or three or four times as big so that the heart is never going to, you know, the, the one organ that has to keep going in your body is going to keep going, okay? So, again, this is just another, another theory. So, some of the evidence, and we'll, we'll look at some slides of this, but let's just sit on this first slide for a second. Uh, the fossil record, you know, provides clear evidence of how organisms change over time. I mean, we have fabulous, you know, chronological fossil records for many, many organisms. Uh, there are still holes in the fossil record, you know, as we continue to find new fossils, we continue to fill in the, the gaps, uh, but the fossil record is by no means complete yet, and I would imagine at some point, if we keep looking, which we will, we will find, um, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll fill in the gaps that are existing. Some of the gaps, um, there's some, there, there are some gaps that have actually been recently filled in between the pre-homo sapien into the homo sapien, which is what we are. Uh, also, there's a gap between non-flowering plants and plants that make flowers. Uh, there's actually a large gap there. And, uh, you know, this is difficult to explain, but again, we continue to find new fossils. Comparative anatomy, and we'll talk about convergent and divergent evolution. To converge means to come together, to diverge means to split apart. Again, we'll look at some slides of this. Comparative embryology, we see similarities in the embryonic stages of vertebrates, for example, and we'll look at a slide. Biomolecular evidence, all living things use DNA, RNA, ATP, and the same 20 amino acids. So you can't deny that all living things are at least related on a biomolecular level. And then we'll talk about artificial selection, which can demonstrate evolution in controlled breeding. Like for example, if you look at dogs, which, you know, 8,000 years of human artificial selection has created everything from a St. Bernard to a Chihuahua from a wolf, right? Okay. So let's talk a little more detail about some of these. Oops, shoot. Okay, uh, so let me make sure I didn't skip two. Okay, that's good. So what is convergent evolution? In a similar environment, unrelated organisms might evolve superficially similar structures. We call these structures analogous structures. And so what this is saying is, 
the environment, environmental pressures kind of force these organisms to develop superficially similar structures. So here's, a, here's one example before we go to the next slide that I'd like for you to, to do. Close your eyes and imagine a penguin. You see a penguin, look at its forelimbs, its, its flippers, its wings, right? A penguin is a bird. Look at, um, think about a shark and think about a whale, a shark, a whale, and a penguin, right? Their forelimbs look remarkably similar, don't they? The flippers of a whale and the fins of a shark and the wings of a penguin all look remarkably similar. Yet one is a bird, one is a cartilaginous fish, and one is a mammal, right? Why would their limbs look similar if they're not related? Well, because of a similar environment, in this case, water, right? So they developed what we call analogous structures, which are superficially similar, but it doesn't mean that they are closely related. Here's another example. You have a, a flying fox, a fruit bat, an eastern bluebird, and this thing is a pterosaur, which is an extinct dinosaur. You know, there again, we have a mammal, a bird, and a, and a depending on who you ask, a reptile or a, or a bird, and you can see the analogous structures. Okay, so there's convergent evolution. Divergent to diverge means to split apart, right? And so in divergent evolution, we see, for example, the forelimbs of birds and mammals of uh, having very similar functions, uh, but their bone structure is, uh, I'm sorry, the forelimbs of birds and mammals have very different structures, but their bone structure uh, are different functions, but their bone structure is remarkably similar. And we call these homologous structures. So the idea here is you have a species, right? And that species diverges. Into, you know, we'll let this be species A and species A over time splits into two new species, species B and species C, okay? And so, you know, now we, we, these species have split, but they still both have homologous, can have homologous structures, which go back to their original sort of mother species, okay? So that's another, uh, Another thing to think about. And here's a good, this is a nice slide. It shows examples of divergent evolution. So we see a monkey, a whale, a pig, and a bird. And you can see that their, their hands have been sort of modified based upon their environment. So the birds look the least similar you know, but think about a whale. Why does a whale have fingers? Why does it have finger bones, right? Well, because it's, it's, uh, it's going back to its original roots, if you will, right? I mean, look at a monkey and a whale. They're not that different. They have, whales have uh, carpals and metacarpals, just like we do, okay? But they have a fin. They don't need these fingers, right? Pigs modified to walk around, um, on all fours. So the idea is the reason there are these similarities is because they all go back to a to a common species, a common ancestor way back when, and they diverged over time based upon their environment. Okay. Comparative embryology is fascinating as well. I don't know if you all were aware of this, but you know if you look at the embryological development uh, early on, here's a fish, a reptile, a bird, and a human, and they all look remarkably similar. They all have tails. We have a tail when we're developing. We also have gill slits. We possess the DNA to have to make gills, right? We believe that comparative embryology, it's environmental baggage, right? We don't have gills, but we still carry the DNA and it's expressed during the uh, developmental embryological stages, right? Um, 
so you know that's a, that's a, another it's 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 further evidence that everything is related right what about this theory of evolution? Charles Darwin, boy, he opened up a can of worms, didn't he? Uh, a little bit about Darwin. Darwin was not really a scientist. And a uh, little bit of the history. He was asked to take a trip on the HMS Beagle. The Beagle was going from Europe around the Horn of Africa and back. And they were looking for a cartographer and a naturalist to take along. Charles Darwin was an aristocrat. His father was very wealthy and they were aristocracy. And back in the day um, on ships, the captain was always aristocracy, but the crew were peasants. And so often the captain would invite another aristocrat, you know, another someone a little higher up on the social hierarchy to go along on the trip so that he had someone to dine with and hang out with because of course the you know, the aristocrats don't hang out with the peasants back in the day. So, you know, uh, the, the captain of the HMS Beagle was friends with Darwin's father, and they were like, you know, maybe Darwin would like to go. Charles was like, sure, I'll go. So Charles got on this boat. Well, uh, as they went, and he started observing uh, different traits among the organisms he was seeing, he developed this theory of evolution over the course of the year. And you know, some of the things that he looked at were finches. He saw different finches on different islands in the Galapagos. Uh, and they all were strikingly similar, but their beaks were different. And, and he postulated that maybe they all were one, you know, maybe there was this flock of, of finches that was flying and they got blown off course and they ended up on these different islands. And these, because these different islands were slightly different in terms of their habitat over time, these organisms adapted to their environment and they changed, okay? So let's, let's talk a little bit about his theory. This is perhaps the most important slide or one of the most important slides in the slideshow, okay? Because if you understand this slide, then you basically understand the theory of evolution. Here's what Darwin came up with. He said, number one, random mutations are constantly occurring in a population. We know that this is true. We can measure mutation now. We can look at DNA. We can see the mutation on the DNA. Of course, Darwin couldn't do that, but he was speculated that this was true. As the environment changes, a given mutation may become beneficial. This is what we call natural selection. And we'll look at some really dramatic examples of natural selection that, that have occurred in, in modern time, okay? Survival of the fittest, right? Really, it's reproduction of the fittest it would be better. Darwin used the term survival of the fittest, but the reality of it is, is that if you have a mutation that's beneficial, but you never reproduce, you never pass that mutation on, right? But if you think about it as reproduction of the fittest, well, if you have a mutation that's beneficial, these individuals are more likely to survive and reproduce due to their beneficial mutation and then pass that mutation on. Likewise, if you have a so-called bad mutation, you're less likely to survive and reproduce and pass that bad mutation on. What this does is it changes a species over time. Over time, a population or a species as a whole will change based upon natural selection and random mutation. So this is important. Now, Perhaps one of the best ways to understand evolution is to look at some modern examples, some examples that we can actually measure and, and see. A lot of studies have been done with bacteria and measuring mutant, uh, mutant strains of bacteria uh, just in general on petri plates or also because they are super mutant strains of pathogenic bacteria, which are making people sick or killing them, okay? But let's talk a little bit about the pepper moss and tree lichens in Europe. This is often cited as one of the most dramatic examples of, um, of modern day evolution. And so here's the thing, the pepper moth is a type of moth and there are two different kinds, two different colors of the same species of pepper moss. There are silver, which 
95% of all pepper moths were at the time in Europe. And then there were black mutants. And the black mutants were about 5%. Now, if you've ever looked at trees, you know there are these things called lichens which grow on the trees. And we'll look at some pictures of these. Uh, but what was happening was the silver pepper moths had a selective advantage over the black ones because the pepper moths are fed on by birds. So birds will see the pepper moths and eat them. Well, back in the day, if you were a silver pepper moth, you blended in with the, with the tree lichens. And so it was more difficult for the bird to see you. Whereas the black pepper moths stuck out like a sore thumb, if you will. And it was very easy for the birds to spot them and pick them off. Well, this was the case up until the Industrial Revolution in Europe. And during the Industrial Revolution, people began burning coal and they began burning a lot of coal. And it was a dirty coal. And the way that they were burning it was very inefficient. And pretty soon, everything got covered with this black soot, including the tree lichens. Everything was black. And when everything turned black, all of a sudden, this change in the environment became a selective advantage for the black pepper moth. Now, all of a sudden, the birds couldn't see the black ones because everything was covered with soot, yet the silver ones stood out. And guess what happened? We'll put pre here for pre-industrial and post for industrial. Guess what happened? They flip-flopped over time. So what are we looking at here? The coal burning didn't cause the mutant black pepper moths. It just selected for them, right? So that's important to understand, okay? So it's a combination of random mutation and environmental and, and uh, natural selection. The environment selecting at a given, in a given environment for or against a given phenotype. You can think of it that way because you know what that word means. Cockroaches in Florida, oh my goodness. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with cockroaches in Florida, but there are lots of them. And uh, Florida was literally being overrun by cockroaches. Um, because it's warm there, it never gets cold and cockroaches like warm weather. They had the German cockroach, the Chinese cockroach, the you name it, they had a lot of cockroaches and people were going nuts until good folks at Dow Chemical back in the 70s, invented what they called very cleverly, the Roach Motel. Now this may be before your time. It's this little hexagonal shaped plastic thing with poison in the middle, right? And I'll draw a little cockroach here. And the cockroaches of course are attracted to the poison and they go through this little hallway and they go in there and they eat the poison. And then they take it back to their, their larva or their, their you know, their, their nest. And the, the, the Dow, Dow had this clever jingle back when I was a kid. It, it, it was, a, it was their, for their advertising. It said, Roach Motel, roaches check in, but they don't check out. That was what the, what the ad would say. Well, within literally a matter of months, people bought these roach motels, they put them out. Literally within a matter of months, the cockroaches were gone. People were like, thank you, Dow. This is a miracle. It's a miracle. We're, we no longer are inundated with cockroaches. Well, a uh, few more months went by, a year went by, and then all of a sudden the cockroaches started reappearing and people were like, oh, I guess we need to get some more of these roach motels. And so they did and they put them out. And what they realized was that the roaches were kind of thumbing their noses at the, um, at these roach motels, they weren't interested. And the chemists at Dow were like, what the hell is going on here? So what they figured out was that these roaches had mutated to not like sugar. Now, because sugar is the most readily available food for a cockroach, that was what Dow Chemical chose to put in their roach motel mixed with their poison bait. And so what happened was um, this sugar poison killed 99, probably 99.999% of all the cockroaches. But there was a very small percentage of cockroaches that had mutated to not like sugar, right? 
And so they were the only ones that survived. Now, not liking sugar, if you're a cockroach, would in, in a normal environment be a selective disadvantage, right? But all of a sudden it becomes an advantage. Well, those were the ones that survived. They bred, they passed that genetic mutation on. And then we had an entire population of mutated cockroaches that didn't eat sugar. So what did the folks at Dow do? Well, they mixed every imaginable thing and ripped their bait. They mixed protein and sugar and starch and cardboard and anything that a cockroach might, you know, mutate to want to eat or not want to eat is in there. Okay, so that's a good example. Super mutant strains of bacteria and insects. Oh my goodness, we have done a number on these. Um, random mutations um, have created a lot of issues for, um, you know, for humans, particularly with mutant strains of bacteria, there are mutant strains of staph, MRSA resistant, uh, or uh, yeah, MRSA resistant staph for which no known antibiotic will cure. Now it used to be if you got a staph infection, it would become septic and you would die. And then we created antibiotics, which took care of that problem, but because they were misused and mis, mis, uh, misprescribed and misused by patients, um, it created this environment that was ripe for these mutant strains to survive. And so now, you know, if you get MRSA staph, they give you like the top shelf antibiotic, it might not work. Okay, same with insects, uh, you know, from using overuse of, herb, of pesticides, we have mutant strains of insects. Okay. And then think about variety in dogs and cats, particularly dogs. Again, dogs were, uh, they, they've evolved from wolves and then they were artificially selected by humans for different reasons. You, some of the lap dogs you might think, like a chihuahua, for example, um, was just bred to be a lap dog, but that's not the case at all. Chihuahuas were actually bred to kill rats because they're small enough to get down in a rat hole and they're very fierce animals. They have large teeth. Uh, so, you know, if you consider a St. Bernard and chihuahua are the same species, humans have created these by artificial selection, by saying, I like this trait and I'm gonna find another uh, a male and a female, and I'm going to breed them together. I'm going to select for this particular trait. Okay. So these are all good examples. Let's look at some pictures here now. I think we have a picture of pepper moss. Let's see. Just so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, there you go. So there's a little bit of lichen there uh, at this shown in the slide, but then take a look. There's the silver one that blends in, and there's the black one, and you can see in this case, the background is black, and so the silver one stands out. The bird's going to come eat it. Okay. All right. So now we get into this idea of population genetics. And we've done Mendelian genetics, right? And in Mendelian genetics, what did we deal with? We dealt with a set of parents, right? And that set of parents, we bred them together, and we followed the traits from them through the gametes and into the offspring. In population genetics, you look at an entire population and the alleles of an entire population, we call that the allele frequency of a population. And you follow, rather than following the individual offspring, you follow the frequency of alleles in the entire population. So normally in a face-to-face -face class, I would say, okay, for the rest of the semester, everyone in this room is a population. And of course, we can't do that now. I guess we're a population of Zoom. <laughs> okay, so what is population? It's a group of individuals living in a common location. To be in a population, you have to be in able to be in physical contact with, uh, with the uh, others of your population. Okay. Population genetics deals with the frequency and distribution of alleles in the population. That's what we're interested in. All the alleles in the population, not just the alleles of individuals. What's the gene pool? It's all of the genes in a given population. Okay, so we're going to look at this example, okay, of population genetics. Let's just say we have a field, a farmer's field, and in that farmer's field, there's a hundred pea plants, and we're using pea plants because we use them in Mendelian genetics, and we talked about red and white flowers, right? So now fast forward to population genetics. And if we have 100 pea plants, each pea plant has a pair of alleles. 
So what would the gene pool for flower color, it would be, there would be 200 alleles in the gene pool, right? And so now we could talk about the allele frequency. Let's say the allele frequency in this population, it's very stable. And the allele frequency of red to white is 140 red alleles to 60 white alleles, and that adds up to 200. Okay, what is evolution? How can we measure evolution? In population genetics, evolution is nothing more than a change in the allele frequency of a population. If, a, if the allele frequency of a population changes, we can say evolution has occurred within that population. Because all evolution is, is that a population changes over time, and that's measurable. So let's just say that this population in this field has been stable for 10 years. And all of a sudden, Farmer Joe is like, you know, I need to run some cattle in that field. And so Farmer Joe puts a head of cattle in the, uh, in the field. And let's just say for whatever reason, because cows are just the way they are, they prefer the red pea plants. Maybe they're sweeter. Maybe they can see them better because they're red. For whatever reason, there doesn't have to be a reason why the cow prefers the red pea plants. Let's just say the cow does prefer them, okay? Well, if that happened over time, what we would see is a change in the allele frequency. And let's say that over time, the allele frequency changes to 20 red to 180 white, because all of a sudden now the cow is selecting against the red peas and for the white peas. This is evolution through natural selection. Natural selection being the cow foraging. Now let that sink in for a second. Okay. This is another really important slide. If you understand this slide, you understand what's going on. This illustrates four important points. Natural selection does not cause genetic change in individuals. Say it out loud, natural selection does not cause genetic change in individuals. The cow didn't cause the white flowers. They were already there as a random mutation. It simply favored their survival by selecting against the red ones, right? By preferring to eat the red ones. Here's another thing. Natural selection befalls individuals and evolution occurs in populations. As an individual, I'm sorry to tell you, you cannot evolve. <laughs> in a philosophical way, you can evolve, but in a biological way, as an individual, you can't evolve. You can only be selected for or against. Evolution occurs in populations. Individuals are, nat are naturally selected for or against. Okay. On this level, evolution is simply a change in the allele frequency. If the allele frequency changes, population has changed, that's evolution. Here's another really important point. Evolutionary changes are not good or progressive, okay? They are just what they are in a given environment at a given time. Think about, you know, you see the ascent of man where they show the man crawling on all fours and then he's slightly more upright and then he's slightly more upright and he's walking on two legs, right? Well, that implies that there's some progressiveness to it, but that's really not the case. You can bet that if there was some natural selective event that occurred, it made it more beneficial for survival for humans to crawl around on all fours again, we would, okay? So what might be an advantage in one environment when the environment changes may no longer be an advantage. And we saw that with the peas and the cow, okay? Okay. Um, I think, I think we'll stop there at this slide and, uh, you know, we'll, um, next time in the next video, we'll talk about Hardy Weinberg's equilibrium population. And I'll just give you a little preface. Hardy and Weinberg were two scientists. They were population geneticists and they, were, they wanted to come up with an example of a population that did not evolve, right? And they, so in other words, they, they, they thought, what would be some criteria that would have to be in place for a population not to evolve? And you can see here what they came up with and we'll, uh, we'll talk about this, um, talk about this again next time.
And uh, I hope you enjoyed the hope you enjoyed the lecture. And I will see you all on the flip side. Have a great day. Bye bye.